Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're watching this later, some other time. Uh, I'm Dr. Nate Pritz. I want to talk a little bit today about uh, planning and recording audio lectures in your online classes. Um, this is actually going to be a little bit quicker than a quick start guide, uh, more of a blitz through what uh, I wanted to share with you today. But I'll provide a roadmap at the end for anyone who wants to dig a little deeper or undertake a project like this themselves. Uh, earlier this year, I was thinking about different ways to reach students outside of the classroom LMS, ways to extend the learning to meet them more within the context of their daily lives, to continue to engage them even when they weren't in the established environment. One of the things I started to think about was making audio recordings of my classroom lecture. So this is the journey I took to recording that audio instructional content. In the end, I didn't just read my classroom lectures into a mic. Instead, I took a deep dive into the world of podcasting and transformed my weekly lectures, leaning into the strengths of the medium, adding new elements, and making them easily accessible so students can take them wherever they want and listen however they choose, disrupting the LMS and bringing the classroom to life anywhere. While I'm sharing, I'm not really going to be able to pop up the chat window because that has a tendency to crash my computer. So I will definitely um, be able to answer some questions at the end. Um, forgive me if I'm not responding to you there. Uh, so these are the steps I took, the stages, uh, the order of operations for my uh, little endeavor. Step one was to plan the project. I wanted to spend some time figuring out the how and the why so that uh, I wouldn't have to keep reinventing the wheel in the long run. Uh, the second stage was to plan the recording itself. I developed an outline and I'll share that with you. Uh, stage three was to actually lay it down. Uh, I had a little bit of a script, more of a tablature, which I'll share with you. Uh, and then step four was okay. editing, listening to myself uh, again and again, over and over uh, and getting kind of sick of myself. So as I said, the first stage of all this was planning the scope of my project. If you're experienced with audio recording, you might come into this entire process with a slight leg up. There are definitely some logistics you need to get out of the way, uh, how to actually record onto your computer, how you're going to edit uh, after you've got everything recorded. But this kind of thing is going to vary depending on your operating system, uh, the hard and software that you have available. So I'm not going to go too much into detail with that right now. The internet has tons of advice, some of it good. Um, and I've got some resources that I'll share at the end that can point you in the right direction. But once the logistics are out of the way, the more theoretical aspects of the project really need to be established. I spent a lot of time grappling with the scope of my project. Uh, I needed to figure out if I was planning to just record basic audio tracks for my text lectures, or if I was going to do something more. Uh, did I, in fact, want to create a larger umbrella, some kind of space that would encompass everything I might do and might want to do in the future. I knew I wanted something durable, a forum that could encompass the different uses I might find for it over time. My initial plan was to record my five weekly lectures, but it was important to me that the scope of what I was doing would allow me to add things to it over time and it wouldn't seem out of place or, or weird. And Someone might need to mute. Someone might think I should mute, but I'm going to keep talking. Um, <laughs> so I spent a few days thinking about what I really wanted to gain from the process, both for my students and for myself. And I tried to imagine what that finished product would sound like, how it would function, and where it would live. Um, so that it wouldn't just be a ragged collection of audio. After I had planned the project overall, I needed to spend some time planning the recording. Whether you think you're going to read a pre-written lecture, narrating along to some PowerPoint slides, or you're going to just sort of riff extempore off a given topic, it's important to make some type of rough speaking notes outline. But remember that your audio recording might encompass more than just your voice. You'll want to find ways to manage pauses. I'm pausing to create some oral counterpoints, to modulate your voice in ways that might come really naturally in front of an audience, but will be harder to orchestrate sitting alone in your office. And on top of that, you might want to give some thought to all manner of accompaniment, 
music or sound loops, uh, a well-placed bird chirp. An outline for the recording helps you set expectations for the listener and ensures that the learning lands the right way. It also helps make sure that you know what to say and when to say it. There are dozens of template suggestions online and listening to a few episodes of your favorite podcast will give you a sense of that underlying structure, uh, basically help you crack the code and uh, figure out a way to replicate it. Obviously, this is gonna vary uh, if you're recording a full lecture or just a quick hit of a difficult concept. But here's the outline that I roughly followed. Again, I was recording full audio lectures for each of the weeks in my class. Um, I had an opening, uh, what I called a bright beat, just an opening sound of some type to establish a baseline and let the listener know that things were working. Uh, and then I built in a little bit of a teaser. Uh, I tried to encapsulate what's to come and ask some provocative questions to motivate students to keep listening uh, and to kind of prime the pump for what uh, they might expect coming up. I had a little bit of intro music that then segued into the welcome which was a standard bumper bite that I recorded uh, and used in all of my recordings. I just recorded it once and was able to repurpose it where I just simply identify myself and the course. Uh, this went into an opening call to action. It was another standard sound bite. I recorded it once, but used it in every one of my lectures. It was a way for me to direct students to additional layers of support, basically just to put them in the right direction. Then I went into the actual content, the instructional materials, the lecture that I wanted to record. And then I had a closing call to action, which was similar to the opening call, but different in that now the lecture was done. So I said things like, now that you've listened through this week's lecture, click into your classroom and scroll through the text version to boost your mastery of these concepts. And then I ended with some closing music. Whether you script out every moment of your recording or just have a sheet of bullet points, spending some time planning it out will ensure that you don't ramble on and will provide important anchors for the learning. So in the next stage, I had to actually record it. I had to lay it down uh, with my template and my talking points all roughed in and figured out. I figured I was ready to rock and roll, uh, completely prepared to start recording, but I stumbled over my own voice almost immediately. I caught myself doing a combination of direct reading and flying off the cuff that led to a complicated mismatch and confused concepts and lost the meaning entirely. Uh, I had a plan, uh, but I needed to do a read through to make sure that I was comfortable with how I was actually going to execute that plan. I basically couldn't just jump right in. For me, that meant taking the text of my lecture and putting it in a separate Word document so I could notate it. It's kind of like what I'm doing right now. I've scripted out a little bit of what I wanted to say, and it's on a Word document. If you're looking at my face instead of the PowerPoint, you can see I have this weird unearthly glow. It's because my uh, iPad is here and I'm scrolling through it, reading off a little bit. But instead of a normal Word document, I've notated it, adding spaces between words to remind myself when I should slow down uh, or for emphasis. I've used bold font and different sizes to remind me to speak up or to uh, slow down with italics. So I don't really, I didn't use a script format for the audio recording, much like I'm not using a script format now, but it is a kind of tablature that worked for me. I realized also that recording the entire lecture in one go was super exhausting uh, and led to less than stellar results. So while I always intended to record some of those elements like the teaser and the opening call, I always intended to record those separately. Um, I found it an, uh, important to break down my lecture as well, to record it in two or three or four minute bursts. There were of course natural section or paragraph breaks, so it wasn't that difficult to figure out where that might take place. I would sometimes just pause the recording uh, and come back to it a little later on. Other times I would actually finalize that element of it and come back and start a whole new recording later. Um, a lot of times I would mess up while I was reading my lectures and uh, because I had the editing part of this process, which we'll get to in a second, built in, I knew that I'd be able to cut those uh, infelicities out of my lectures. So if I was saying something and stumbled over what I was trying to say, I would just pause, take a breath, 
and rewind myself uh, a couple of words, a couple of sentences and start over, that would give me options for when I was trying to splice it all together later on. In this stage, the editing stage, uh, this may seem the most intimidating, but so many of the tools available are pretty intuitive uh, and they're easy to learn through trial and error. I recorded most of my audio lectures using voice memo, which you might have on your phone or you might have on your computer. Uh, and then I record, I dropped those separate tracks into GarageBand. I run on a Mac, so it was easy for me to use that to visualize the tracks, to splice them together, to make it sound the way that I wanted it to. There are other tools though, and again, I'll, I'll point you to some of those uh, in a minute. Beyond the technical stuff, though, I had to listen to myself uh, again and again, over and over, uh, and I had to resist the urge to re-record every little stutter, every little um, every little moment where I sniffled or coughed, uh, and I figured it was better to capture the passion behind what I was saying as opposed to trying to make it perfectly perfect. Um, after a while, it became kind of fun. I got to make decisions about timing and pacing, I cut and trimmed the clips to make them fit better. I sequenced it all to make it flow in the way that I wanted. And I used incidental music and different sound loops to function as transitions throughout the lecture and to make for a more engaging listening experience. I, I could have waited, I guess, until I needed a sound bite, um, but I kind of gathered them all in one big lump sum. I thought it would be better to have a toolbox that I can reach into instead of having to run out to the store every time I needed something new. So I had a big big uh, file folder on my desktop full of every imaginable sound and music bit that I might want. And then I could just reach into that and, and grab uh, when I needed something. You could do that earlier, you can do that later. There are again, lots of resources online for free sound bites, free music, stuff that you can repurpose for educational use. So uh, I'll point you to some of those at the end. So then I got to you know the end. I thought I had wrapped things up uh, when all was said and done, uh, and then said again and redone and said again and redone again. I had five audio files on my desktop, but they weren't doing anyone any good sitting there. If you want your students to actually be able to hear these things, you need to find some place to put them. And I'll admit this is where I hit some snags. Initially, I thought I would just place the audio files within the text lectures of the Canvas classroom, but at least at first glance, Canvas didn't seem to support that kind of download. Someone here might be able to correct me, but I couldn't figure it out in the moment. Um, and rather than butt my head against it, I pivoted and decided to post them to my teaching Tumblr, a separate site that I maintain. Um, so without even testing if that was possible, I built out a page on the Tumblr site where I would post everything up. And uh, when I tried to actually upload them, I found that I couldn't do it there either. Uh, it, it, again, seems like it's possible, but I just couldn't figure it out and I didn't quite have the patience to do it. So I went with plan C uh, and plan C ended up being uh, exactly what I needed. Uh, some of you might know that I maintain a separate Vimeo page for instructional videos for my classes. So I built a separate SoundCloud page to host all the audio files. Rather than having to keep track of what versions I had posted in what location, I could just change the files on SoundCloud and know that the, most, the newest version would always be pushed out to the different locations that I had set for them. So I'm gonna turn the PowerPoint off here for a second and just show you real quickly. Um, here is the classroom, the Canvas classroom. This is a uh, week five in one of my classes. And you can see here's the guidance lecture. And if you just scroll down right away, you've got a little icon that lets students know they can listen now to this uh, audio track of the lecture. They can click here and they can get immediately to what they need. And they're all archived here on the SoundCloud page that I built out. So all the tracks, all the different lectures are all here. Um, students can link to each one or download them individually. But uh, if they make their way to this page, all of them are here for them to take a look at. That's me in a Darth Vader costume when I was a little too old to be dressed up like Darth Vader on Halloween. 
here's the uh, aforementioned multimedia lounge on my uh, teaching Tumblr page. Uh, we've got the same little uh, icon here. Students can click over to SoundCloud and, and listen, or they can watch the videos. Everything's kind of in one set location. And I also provide students with this link tree. Uh, if you haven't used link tree, it's a really cool little tool. Gives you one link and you can post as many different elements on that link as you want. I think maybe it caps at seven. But um, when I communicate with students, I always include this link. And if they click it, they've got immediate access to the audio lectures, to the video channel, to information about the film class. So a lot of different ways to get to what they need to get to. Here are the resources I kept talking about. Um, those links don't work because you're watching me talk about this on a PowerPoint. Um, and there, there's some uh, articles that kind of talk a little bit more about the theoretical underpinning of what I've done. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. I'm gonna pop the chat open uh, and I'm gonna share a link in the chat. Uh, this link will bring you to a separate site where I've compiled this entire lecture into a 20 page audio book or 20 page ebook. You'll be able to download that, go through these slides and my materials at your leisure, click all the links, listen to the tracks if you want to. Um, and it also provides a Word doc, doc download of the outline I shared earlier. So you can have all that stuff right on your desktop without me trying to share it here. So uh, in an effort to um, look at any of these, I'm just gonna scroll through here really quickly. Yeah, Nina, I pulled, I pulled oh. a couple out. Um, Catherine Claypaw said, are there resources available to us through Ashford to help us learn the technical side of all this? I know you just shared the audio book, but I, I'm not sure if you know of any other trainings through the library or? I, I don't know trainings. I mean, I I just Googled around a lot and, and played around a lot. I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but this took me about two months of planning, thinking, uh, screwing it up, making mistakes, ruining it, uh, and trying again. Uh, so um, I don't know other than some of the resources that I've shared and maybe just Googling around. I, I'm sure that we, um, you know, Canvas lets you record video or audio right within Canvas, but I wanted something that I could make a little bit more portable disrupt the LMS and kind of pull students out of it a little bit to bring the learning more to them. Uh, so that's why I kind of went the Google route rather than uh, going through whatever trainings we might have been had for Canvas. I don't know much about Kaltura. Um, I don't. I don't know that um, everybody necessarily has access to that through Ashford. That might be something you want to ask your um, direct supervisor to see if you do have those. Um, Lynette is uh, an adjunct who occasionally teaches the film class, so she's um, seen these resources that I've been sharing them out. Uh, she's kind of watched me make mistakes and stumble and build them. Uh, we're hearing from students that they're great. Some of these um, that they're really enjoying them. Some of the um, tracks already have over 60 plays and they've only been live in about three classes so far. So students are definitely clicking um, and I'm glad to hear that. John asks about buying a separate mic. Um, I'm, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a second so I can see things. Uh, you know, I do have a separate mic. I don't think it's totally required. Um, I am gonna hold this up to the camera here. This is my little blue snowball, John. Um, it plugs right into the USB port on my computer. Uh, I also downloaded uh, a browser add-on called Crisp, K-R-I-S-P, which minimizes background noise. Um, those things I think have really helped, but at the end of the day, I don't know that I sound better or worse than anybody else. I think if you've got a laptop that you trust, I think you can talk right into it and uh, be totally fine. Mark's got the really fancy rig over there though. Everyone's in, impressed with his setup. And it's a, not a very expensive mic. I was going for the under one hundred dollars that best that I could get. So it's it's called new newer newer N E E W E R. It's the eight hundred model. It's like it was like thirty bucks on Amazon, and I just had to buy an additional power source for it because my P 
computer couldn't uh, like if you're like laptops and stuff, you need the additional power source, which, which, was, which was like under 20 bucks. So it was like all, all around 50, but if at each price point, like it's like under a hundred and then like maybe like up to like 150 or 200. And then there's mics that, you know, run way up, but it, there's, there's good guides on like YouTube about like mic buying at different price points. So that's what I used. I'm going to share that link in the chat one last time, just in case it flew by you. You can click over to there, download the ebook. Uh, it's got all my uh, contact information too. So if you have any questions about this going forward, shoot me a note. I know some people are talking about other types of training. Um, I, you know, I don't know, hit me up. If you catch me on the right day, I'll, I'll set up a 30 minute with you and we'll make it happen. I would love to be able to see people leverage audio and video more in their classes. So I'd be happy to help uh, with any, any type of development like that that you guys might want to undertake. I see Mary just asked really quickly about storing these things. Um, I, I, I wanted to create the SoundCloud page simply partly because it allowed me better um, functionality for analytics for tracking this stuff. Um, I, I do believe that you can store some of this stuff in Canvas, but I'm just not super familiar with how that works. So to me, going outside of the LMS, which is kind of part of the process to begin with, uh, was really the best way to handle it. Um, Canvas does have tools that allows you to record video and audio directly in the classroom shell, and that would all be stored in Canvas. So you can always do those types of things very quickly on the discussion board or as part of an announcement. But because I knew I wanted something a little bit broader in scope, uh, going outside was the way that I thought was the best best serve for me. I can give you like uh, one minute here of this. Um, Anytime a movie makes you think, it's doing its job of furthering discussion of a specific issue. Unlike the talking heads on the news, those people who want to persuade you to think the way they do, a film can excel by illustrating the various sides of an issue without providing any clear-cut solutions. So you're hearing there the, that beginning bright beat, and that's just a little bit of my um, beginning sort of pitch to the students. So week four is about sound and music. So that's just a little, a little quick hit of, um, I mean, like I said, it gives you the opportunity to use a lot of outside sound effects, to use music, uh, especially important in a class like film, but it could be important in any class. So just a little bit of a, of a way that I kind of wove, wove, woven, weaved things together. I think you missed your calling as a radio lab uh, producer, Nate. 